name is Ryan Parrish. I'm at the University of Memphis in Tennessee. Um, I'm an archaeologist, so my mind is way in the past, thousands of years ago. Uh, I like old junk. Uh, I've been accused of being a dumpster diver before and getting into people's trash and recycling, reusing things. So that's where my mind is at. Um, but I'm excited to get to Chile. Uh, I have a good friend in Arica, Cesar Bori, uh, who uh, came up and lived with us in, in Memphis uh, a number of years ago to work on his dissertation with me. He's still finishing up his dissertation. So one of my primary tasks while down here is to advise him and get his dissertation complete. Uh, but he came up with me. Um, uh, to, to be with me, he brought uh, some ancient artifacts uh, from some of the archaeological sites he's been uh, working on uh, because uh, I've um, uh, developed and I use uh, a unique technique that um, not, uh, no one that I know of is using uh, around the world. And I've brought those instrumentations and the methods and knowledge here uh, to Chile to, to share and train up a, a new generation of, of archaeologists. Uh, so, as I mentioned before, I'm interested in the past uh, as an archaeologist to study uh, humans, the human race, um, the people who lived on the landscape long before us, how they adapted, survived, and how they commun communicated with one another. And uh, I, I am not just doing this type of research just to, because it's interesting and for knowledge's sake, but rather I think we can learn a lot uh, from the past and a knowledge of the past is beneficial to us here in the present and also can help us kind of predict the future. Um, uh, these uh, people dealt with a severe climate change. Uh, they dealt with uh, resource depletion or overuse of important resources to them and they uh, navigated uh, through climate or and they navigated social boundaries with uh, each community in order to kind of stave off those shortfalls or sometimes they didn't and they uh, they collapsed they perished uh, they moved to other locations so specifically uh, myself and my colleagues here are interested in uh, rock a specific type of rock called chert or flint that prehistoric people uh, utilize around the world to make their stone tools their knives their arrowheads their spear points and uh, these uh, types of materials aren't located all over the landscape. They're located in discrete pockets. So we uh, view um, this uh, type of rock as resources to them. Of course, you could use bone or ivory or wood uh, to make sharp uh, projectile points, but uh, rock is uh, more durable and held a, a sharper edge. So uh, specifically uh, in uh, Chile, uh, my friend and I are looking at sites along uh, the coast uh, where these hunter-gatherer groups live. These people lived uh, here upwards of 9,000, 8,000 years ago. Uh, this was way before agriculture, way before uh, pyramid building and things like that. And they uh, utilize uh, marine resources here, the fish and everything along the coast. Uh, but they also used resources in the Atacama Desert. So they would travel through the Andes Mountains and uh, camp out on wetland sites in the mountains. And then they would go on to the Atacama Desert, which is a, a very hostile <laughs> environment. But what they're, one of the things they're doing there is getting rock, this specific type of chert or flint along uh, pockets in the Atacama Desert. That's not the only thing they're doing there. So what we're hoping to look at is to study where they're getting the rock at and what else they're doing there and how they're transporting that rock uh, back uh, through the mountains, back to their uh, villages, communities along the coast. Uh, my friend and uh, colleague Cesar, he's been using satellite imagery to identify uh, the unique um, uh, pockets of rocks uh, that exist here and he's been doing a great job sampling uh, those sites, getting uh, buckets and buckets of rock out in the desert and, uh, and bringing them back to basically make a library of different uh, material types and where they're located at. Um, so uh, with this giant library, this database of different rock resources, uh, we've been able to, to compile and to analyze all those uh, geologic materials using uh, the two instruments that I uh, brought to uh, Chile. Um, 
these instruments look at uh, parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, so our human eyes can see a small portion of the electromagnetic spectrum. How we look at color is in the visible part. These instruments give us, uh, um, it's like uh, having uh, human eyes on steroids, very, very strong. Uh, you can uh, make uh, slight observations into those changes in the visible, the near infrared, and even into the middle infrared far out beyond what our human eyes can detect. So what we do is we uh, analyze the rocks and the artifacts non-destructively and we come up with um, diagnostic characteristics in the materials and this is all done in order to um, match the artifact made out of the rock back to the spot on the landscape where the prehistoric people got the rock from. And if we can do this accurately, then we can start looking at uh, trade routes, uh, migration patterns. Um, we can start understanding how they're utilizing different resources over time in response to climate change or different things. Uh, what we've been uh, seeing also is how they're constructing their social networks too. When they're exchanging different types of rock uh, with each community, it really uh, solidifies their relationships. So that um, when there's times where maybe the fishing is bad, uh, seasonal resources are, are not so good in one community, they can fall back and rely on those social networks in order to get information and information is, is survival here. Um, so uh, these rocks uh, have unique signatures, which allows us to match the artifact back to the specific outcrop. And of course, uh, uh, many hours spent in the lab analyzing the rocks that we collect in the Atacama Desert and trying to match those sources with the artifacts. So we're looking at uh, prehistoric knives and spear points and even uh, sharp pieces of rock that they would use for everyday tasks. And we analyze those and we treat them as unknown. We don't know where they're getting the rock from. And then we match the unknown artifact back to the known location where we uh, got, uh, got rock from. Uh, using these techniques uh, combined with multivariant statistical methods, um, in uh, R and other programs, we'll process the data. Uh, we'll, um, if, if there's enough information, we'll separate out all the rock samples we collected. Uh, we're talking about thousands and thousands of them into different possible sources. And then we'll take the artifacts and we'll statistically match them to one of those uh, locations if we have it in our library. And what this does is again, it allows us uh, some really cool information. Um, a lot of uh, these communities, all that they left behind was the, the stone. All their other material culture, their clothing, their basketry, um, everything else has, has gone away, has weathered away. But what's left behind is the rock. So we try to get as much information out of those rocks as possible. And we're able to uh, hopefully begin to reconstruct their behavior patterns where they're moving to to get the stone in the desert, how they're bringing it back uh, to the coastline, how they're interacting with one another through exchange of different tools and uh, knowledge. And again, uh, this uh, really helps us as archeologists, not just like invent a time machine and go back and see what they're doing, which is what I think I do sometimes, but also to inform us about um, how some of our decisions, how we use different resources, how we form social networks, how we compete with uh, other nations for those, uh, those relationships is, is really important and how uh, prehistorically people did that as well. So that's a lot of information, a very opt optimistic view of, of what we can do. Uh, but I'll be um, uh, teaching uh, archaeology graduate students at the university there. Uh, on, on these methods and techniques. Uh, they're actually going to be doing a lot of the work uh, for, for us. Uh, we'll uh, go collect uh, more stone uh, types uh, at the end of September here for a couple weeks out in the field. We'll bring those back. Uh, myself and the students will work on processing them. They'll uh, learn how to use the instruments that I have 
and uh, they'll, they'll run the statistics and do the research and at the end it'll be their pr uh, project, not necessarily myself or Caesars. So we hope to uh, publish some really cool papers with the students. Uh, we hope to um, go around uh, to the different universities and kind of give presentations. And uh, I, I would love uh, to identify some graduate students to come up to the United States to, to continue this type of work or uh, a work of their choosing. Uh, because uh, again, these techniques are pretty new and, and no one's really using them. So I just wanted to thank all of you for this amazing opportunity. Uh, thank you very much. Does anyone have any questions? Yes,